Okay, so without any further ado, I apologize for starting fairly close to time, and uh, we'll see, we'll make sure it doesn't happen again, as they say, and uh, you all get the, uh, what's the Polish medal, the Birchwai military or something for coming on the 4th of July. I just want to thank the tech crew over here. I'm not going to drive them as crazy as I did last time with a bunch of movies. Uh, but I'm a big fan of movies. What does that mean? A fan of movies, I, I, I try to download crazy movies nobody's ever heard of. Usually of a foreign country. It tells you about the culture that's going on at that time. If in a Polish movie now, in 1999, they portray the Jews, even if it's Mitzkiewicz's novel, in a, a positive sense, or other things I'll show you, that tells you something about what's going on in Polish culture now. As you know, that's a highly controversial topic because in Poland today, as in yesteryear, there's the Yetzir Tov and the Yetzir Har. There just is. And it's a fascinating uh, kind of, it's a, at least I argue it's a fascinating uh, kind of a phenomenon. And when you look at historical movies, and that's the only thing I'm interested in, uh, you see a lot, of, first of all, about how the, that uh, host culture thinks about the Jews and uh, what sells and what doesn't sell in that movie market and who the producers are and things of that nature. Anyway, that's my uh, predisposition. Without any further ado, I'm going to get right down to tonight. The name of this uh, series, of course, is called Po, Lean Poles and Jews in, in 2018. So I'm taking a perspective looking back, trying to be friends, but prevented by different versions of a common history. This is again in the news today. Just before I came here, I looked online. You know, there, uh, some are criticizing Bibi, some are not criticizing Bibi because Israel cut that deal with Poland the other day. And it's a complicated kind of business, and you really see literally what I'm talking about. They're trying to be friends, but they're blocked by, you know, by, by different versions of a common past. Uh, tonight's lecture is the second one entitled The, the uh, Crisis of the Old Order, uh, Poles, Jews, and the Downfall of the Kingdom. So now I'll get down to it. Last time I started by very quickly talking through the Poland 15, 1600s, because that's when the Jews were there. And that's either the golden age of the Jews of uh, Poland, which it certainly was. It's also the time of the massacres of Tachwatat, and Poland went up and down, in and out. And in spite of everything, and in spite of the tyranny of the nobles and the magnates, they were in their own way kind of good to the Jews. It worked out in a mutually beneficial sort of situation. And for better or worse, even though people don't usually think of it that way, Poland was the best uh, place for Jews, the freest and the, you know, the, the, the widest uh, community, especially if you want to be intensely Jewish. Okay? Um, in other countries, the Jewish religion, among other things, was highly regulated, especially where the Catholic Church was in charge, and even when um, you had uh, Protestant states and even Islamic ones. Uh, a lot of regulations. In Poland, there weren't many laws, and the best part is even when they passed the law, they didn't enforce it. So uh, that's the way the Jews preferred it. Now, things were bad also, but the things were also good. That's my point. Tonight we move to the 18th century, the 1700s, uh, which is the last century of the Kingdom of Poland. By the end of the 1700s, the King of Poland went right down the tubes in an extraordinary way. The 18th century, therefore, was a bad century for the Kingdom of Poland, and I keep repeating myself, and I will again, I keep talking about the Kingdom of Poland. This is a country that no longer exists. This is when Poland included Poland and the Ukraine and Belarus and Lithuania and Latvia. It was a gigantic shtickle kark over there. Uh, and it was a bad century for Poland in terms of politics. Within the country, life generally went on, unless interrupted by war and invasion or whatever. Uh, so let's get right down to it. In 1700, when we start this very fateful century, and our great-grandparents all lived there, but just about everybody as I look around this audience, I'll bet. Um, so you get to 1700, Poland was still pretty big. Look at that. Look at the rest of Europe. Look how big Poland is. <laughs> right? It's huge. So, and again, Poland included Lithuania. Poland included Galicia. Poland included Volinia. Poland included the Ukraine and all that other business. A big piece of land over there. And had the largest Jewish community by far. Uh, but the government system was still as bad as always. And it was the fault of its own ruling class, of the nobles, the shlachta, the magnates, and all that group that I was talking about the other day. Uh, first of all, uh, and this really came to ripening in the sense of an overripe fruit uh, in the 1700s. Uh, first of all, you had the crazy election of kings. The, uh, if you're going to have a monarchy, it's probably wise to have a dynasty uh, for a bunch of reasons. And Poland didn't have that every time the king died. They had a new election, and they were pretty careful not to elect the previous guy. 
And so look what they did. They did something unbelievably stupid. They went, from a high position, Jan Sobieski, as I told yesterday, one of the great kings of Poland, actually one of the great kings of Europe, a very great man and a friend of the Jews. And who came after him? Let's go to the next one. This idiot, okay? Uh, Augustus II, uh, the, who was the elector, no, he was the German prince, uh, of a Protestant too, by the way, Saxony, and very Protestant area. And he wanted to be king of Poland, because <laughs> it's not good enough to be an elector. I want to be a king. And uh, he was totally, what shall I say, he's like the epitome of the self-centered, selfish uh, despot. What he's most famous, he's called Augustus the Strong, because he could bend, uh, you know, uh, horseshoes and things like that. He's most famous for having 400 illegitimate children. Okay? So uh, that's, who you, that, that, that's, that's your claim to fame. He had no other claim to fame. You understand? So he was a king. He ran everywhere he ran. He built palaces, things like this, spend all the money. No, did all the bad things. And there's no good side to it. Okay? And Louis XIV, all right, he spent a lot of money, but he did some good things. You follow? This guy simply uh, uh, d d did the bad. And he was also a loyal, as we'll see. How did he get elected uh, king of Poland? <coughs> Through persuasion. <laughs> you understand? Here's, here's the guy, the court Jew, because I told you each one of these guys had a hofjuda, court Jew. This is the ancestor of the layman's. Okay? That's Baron Layman from way back when. And uh, at least the layman's, I think, claim ancestry from him. He, he was a Jew who made himself of value to the ruler and did banking and uh, the kind of army supplies and the whole sort of thing that I spoke about the other day. Classic example of that. From Guy. He lived in Halberstadt, and he's responsible for building yeshiva there and a cloys and all that kind of business, you know? Uh, and he was the court factor, as they say, or the, the title, here's a golden oldie, if you're old enough to remember the Marcus Lehman books from yesteryear, uh, the orthodox teenage fiction of the 19th century. I'm serious. Uh, I read it when I was a kid. And I didn't know who Augustus the Strong was. And they talk about the fact that this prince, who was totally selfish and all the rest of it, had a thousand girlfriends and all the rest of it, he says, look, come here, Jew. This is how you talk, you know. I want to win the election of Poland, so get me the money. And he went and scrambled some bounds, and they brought the money in, in carts to the election field. <laughs> okay, I mean, it's like Chicago. They're giving out 20s, you know. And, uh, and they bribed the, uh, the uh, nobility to vote for him. There were other considerations as well. And that's how he got elected. What a terrible mistake. So I'm just telling you again, when Jan Sobieski died, he had a son who wanted to take his place. I think his name was Jacob. And he was a good guy. They don't want a good guy. So what kind of nutty system of government is that? Where you want somebody that's kind of like preside over the dysfunctionality, because that's how we like it. Because the dysfunctionality works to my benefit if I'm a magnate. And I don't want the government to tell me what to do. It's like, it's like a libertarian nightmare, you see? And so, uh, anyhow, Augustus is into his own ambitions. Uh, he wanted to be a great king, but he was a real doofus. And the result was that he got involved in all kinds of stupid things, particularly what they call the Great Northern War. This has to do, it's a famous episode. Europe, every year, for the last thousand years until recently, Listen to what I'm saying. If you're a good enough in your facts, in your Jeopardy facts, you can name a war every year somewhere. You understand? I'm, I'm not kidding. Not recently, after America and Russia won the Second World War, so Europe was quiet. That's the first time it's ever been like that. Other than that, there's always a war going on somewhere. You get it? So it's either war between France and England, or it's a war between two Italian duchies, or it's the Ottoman Empire versus the Austrians, or it's the Russians versus this. You just got to keep on top of all this if you're, if you're interested enough to do that. And every year there's a war somewhere. So um, who was it that said, Plato said that war is a natural state of man, you understand? Only the dead have seen the, the last of war. Not the way we like to think we who grew up after the Second World War in the Eleanor Roosevelt era, in which peace is here, and hooray is the United Nations and all the rest of it. Now it'll be smiling forever. Uh, war, unfortunately, is the natural state of man. And since the Second World War, in other words, in our time today, there are wars everywhere, somewhere or other, going on. So where's the war going on right now? For example, Afghanistan comes to the top of your head, right? It's fighting in, in uh, the ISIS some places. It's fighting in the, uh, Africa some places. It's fighting in the Yemen, as you know. 
You see what I'm saying? No, it's never quiet everywhere. So if you go back to Europe in the early 1700s, there were two gigantic wars that took place at the same time. One in South and Central Europe on the one hand, the other one in Northern Europe on the other hand. Uh, only a nut remembers this stuff. Uh, the war in the South and Central Europe was called the War of Spanish Succession. And that was uh, the Duke of Marlborough and Prince Eugene. It's a very famous sort of thing. If you ever go to England, Blenheim Palace and all that sort of business, uh, that's when the English and the Austrians uh, beat uh, Louis XIV. At the same time, a totally separate war was going on of gigantic scale in Northern Europe. It's called the Great Northern War. And who started? This King of Poland, Augustus. As if Poland didn't have enough trouble, wasn't enough broke, all the rest of it. Um, so basically, had to do with the following. Once upon a time, Sweden was a world power. Isn't that weird? What do they call Sweden's American colony? Does anybody know? New Jersey. <laughs> okay. Once upon a time, Sweden was a world power. Either a little country, all the rest of it, that's true. But in the 1600s, they had the best army. Gustavus Adolphus, if you remember that. They had the best army. Uh, they didn't have a big army, but they had the best army. And therefore, they conquered a lot of territory in a bunch of wars. So look what they did. This is Sweden. They owned Finland. They owned what you call today Estonia and, and Latvia. They owned pieces of Germany. They controlled the ingress and egress in, into the Baltic Sea. They were a powerful force. And they did it by conquering. So that means they made a lot of enemies. Who doesn't like them? Everybody around this map. Uh, Denmark and Norway used to be one country, so they don't like Sweden. Poland lost this to the Swedes. So, they, so King Augustus said, so I guess I'll get this back. I'll be here in Poland. And here beyond this is Russia. And if you look closely, the Swedes are blocking Russia that they have no way to get to the sea. So that's a tricky business. You've got a giant bear next to you, and you're you know, holding it by the nose, as it were. And unfortunately for the Swedes, the Tsar of Russia, that's not Peter the Great. You understand? So this is, 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 is a tinderbox waiting uh, you know, to, for the fire to start. Now, this created, therefore, an objective situation in which Sweden was opposed by many countries, Denmark, especially Russia, and Poland. And that's called the Grand Alliance against Sweden. You know, here's a, the, the King of the Emperor of Russia, here's the King of Denmark, and here is our friend, King Augustus of Poland, who's also an elector of Saxony, if you can find. I don't want to overconfuse you. I think I have. Now, Sweden at one point in the late 1600s, looked, this is a great story, looked vulnerable because the king died and his 15-year-old son came on the throne. And he looked very effeminate. And so for 15 years old, and he's a pretty boy, and all the rest of it, so basically, uh, we can walk all over Sweden. Now it's time to hit. As a result, it was an objective situation of a rich kid with a large fortune that looked like he can go after him. And so what was the result? An alliance was formed to go to war against Sweden by all these other countries. Well, boy, did they make a mistake because Jekyll became Hyde. This guy turned into this, you know what I'm saying? Charles XII of Sweden, who's one of the great generals of history. He's a very famous uh, military commander. So he was 18 years old when the war started. And one, two, three, he marched his army across the ice from Sweden to Denmark and captured Copenhagen. That was the end of Denmark. Then he marched from Finland into Russia, what, what we call today uh, St. Petersburg, Narva, which is on the border of Estonia and Russia. And he beat a Russian army like two, three times his size because the Swedish soldiers were just darn good. And Russia was, you know, got a bloody nose. And then he said, I guess, the one I really blame more than anything else is Poland because the king of Poland is the one who started this uh, because the prime minister of the king of Poland, or one of his agents, I should say, was the one who put this, this whole business together. And so what was the result? Uh, from the war lasted 21 years. For the first eight years, Sweden won, 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 won. So this guy marched into Poland. Second time, remember I told you last time the Swedes invaded Poland and caused a lot of trouble? And that happens again. And Augustus tried to beat him and kept getting losing because he can't beat the Swedish army. I mean, the Swedes went to Krakow. That's all the way in the south. They marched all over the country and ravaged and this and that and the other. And they even set up their own king. So now you got two kings in Sweden. And when Augustus ran away to Germany, he chased after him into Germany, okay, to Dresden. Until the end, the guy had to give in. And so Poland was totally defeated. And uh, this took five, six years. And Poland totally defeated. And Sweden's walking all over the place like that. And, uh, and the king was just a warrior type. And then he says, now I'm going after Russia. Okay? And it's one of the great invasions of Russia. And you know what happens over there. 
and it gets wiped out. I mean, it, 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 it's one of the classic cases. Charles XII, Napoleon, and Hitler are the three big examples. Uh, people invaded Russia, it was just too big, you know? And he had, by the way, he had the Ukrainians on his side. Okay, so it's the Swedes, the Ukrainians versus the Russians. But Peter the Great, it's one of the things that made him famous. After he lost the first battle, he spent a lot of time totally rebuilding from the bottom up. He rebuilt the army and the industry and all this kind of junk. And anybody got in his way, he killed him. And, he, and, and in 1709, he wiped out the Swedish army in the Battle of Poltava. Poltava is one of the famous turning battles of history. If you ever read one of these books, 10 famous battles, that's always one of them. Because he wiped out the Swedish army and they only had one. <laughs> you get it? Sweden's a small country. It's uh, a little bit like Israel. You, know, you can't afford to lose. And they lost. And so, uh, so it's a constant business. The king uh, was sick and, he, and, and, and the Russians beat the army and conquered and destroyed it. The king ran away to Turkey and they ran away to that. But by the time it's all over, uh, Charles XII was dead, the Swedes were wiped out, and Russia is now the new power. Okay? Um, Russia is now the new power. And the result was that the war ended. Let's take a look at the next map. It was what we call the Treaty of Neustadt, in which all this went, not to Poland, <laughs> to Russia. So bye-bye, Sweden. Hello, Russia. Bad news. Okay? I mean, from a strictly Swedish perspective, if you want to have an enemy that's bothering you, would you rather have Sweden or would you rather have Russia? You know, you either have a fox or a bear, right? Uh, so this was bad news, obviously, for, uh, for the Poles. Now, uh, from now on, from now on, by the way, let's go back one. There's the St. Petersburg. That's why, they, that's why they built it right there. Because he conquered from the Swedes and he built this, the city there. And that's Leningrad and St. Petersburg, as you know. And so all this area... Poland got this a little bit back, a little bit. Uh, so Augustus, did he win the war? He was an idiot, right? He got rid of Sweden, uh, not in a good way. He got Russia, and for now when Russia controls Sweden. That's the great political reality of the 18th century, and even after. I mean, frankly, down till today, it's the big question. What's the relationship between Poland and Russia? Down till today, right? Um, you know, America, it depends what America does and all the rest of it. What's the first thing Poland did when they got their independence? They said, can we join NATO? Well, why'd they do that? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Why'd they do that? So um, for the next six decades, 1720s, 30s, 40s, 50s, yeah, uh, Poland is controlled by Russia. Uh, the Russians like the doofus kings, Augustus II and his son Augustus III, because they spent all the time chasing girls building palaces. I'm serious about this, right? Um, they let the whole country run down the drain. There were oppositions of nobles to them. It doesn't matter to go into the internal politics. The country continued to go on what they used to call in the 18th century Pol Polish anarchy, right? Which is not a bad term in a national sense. So I'm just trying to tell you, we lived in Poland in the 1700s. It's a crazy place, right? Augustus III, the son of this guy, became the next king in what they called the War of Polish Succession simply because Whoever the nobles vote for, the Russians send an army in and say, you're changing your mind, you're voting for this guy. And they did. It was a war, but by the time it's over, you won. And so, um, let's go to the next one. This a king? Look what they say. This is Augustus III, the, the, the son of the doofus. He says, as king, Augustus was uninterested in the affairs of his dominion. He focused on hunting, the opera, collection of artwork. He spent less than three years of his 30-year reign in Poland because he was also a prince in Saxony, in, in Germany. So he felt better living in, quote, unquote, a civilized country, but you want your royal title. You see? Why did the Poles do this? You, you, you get my point? This is what they mean. Uh, where political feuding between the House of Czartoryski and Potocki paralyzed the same, fostering internal political anarchy, weakening the Commonwealth, the Polish Commonwealth. Augustus delegated most of his powers to Heinrich von Brühl, who was the Viceroy of Poland. So that's true. When they had the Emden Abyschutz fights, uh, later on in the 1750s, each side tried to get to Von Brühl because he was the guy that counted in Poland. You see, where's the king? The king is hunting. <laughs> you know, where? Who cares? So, you know, you can't make this up. Now, um, the result was that Russia, could, you know, anybody could walk into Poland anytime to win an army. Russia could do whatever they want. The country had no real borders. It's the same problem in American politics today. Right? Well, Frank, say what you want. Trump got elected by those who elected him because he said, we got no borders. We got to do something. 
right? And Hillary got unelected because the people said, she said, there's no real borders, you know, you let everybody in. Or words to that, perceived to be that effect. And so it's a problem when a country can't control who's coming in and who's coming out. Poland could not control who's coming in and who's coming out. So what is that? What do you call that? Um, for example, in the 1750s and 60s, there's something called the Seven Years' War. I'll tell you, these 18th century wars are gavaldic, you know. Everybody's, it's like, a, it's like a, a high school dance, you're always switching partners, you know. So in the war of the Austrian succession, it was Austria and England against France and Prussia. And then seven years later, the Seven Years' War, they switched partners. So it's France and Austria against England and Prussia. Can you follow that? Okay. And Russia was on the side of England and France. Uh, so Frederick the Great was the king next door, right? The king next door in Prussia. Uh, he was fighting the Seven Years' War, and he was having a hard time. He came close to losing, but he won. He won all the big battles. Yeah, he was a brilliant general. He was a very bad person, but he was a brilliant general. And every time he, he didn't have enough food and stuff like that, he just marched an army into Poland and took whatever he wanted. Because try and stop me. If you don't have borders, you can't control it. What are you going to do? You going to fight the Prussian army? How are you going to do it? As a matter of fact, if he didn't have enough soldiers, he just marched into Poland. They just grab people. You're in the army now, you're in the army now, you're in the army now. And if you're in the Prussian army, they have what they're called running the gauntlet. You know, Let's put it this way. Would you like to be in the Marine Corps in boot camp? Now, would you like to be in Frederick the Great's boot camp? <laughs> okay. They beat the heck out of you. So therefore, you're, you know, you, when they tell you march to the, to the guns, you do it. And so this is all an example of Poland's utter helplessness as a nation. Okay. Uh, now, what was going? Meanwhile, in the absence of real government, what's happening in Poland? It's all about these magnates, you know, the big rich uh, nobles, and each one's fighting the others. Take a look at this. Yeah, this I think, if I remember correctly, is Czartoryski. This is Potocki. I might have him backwards. I think that's Potocki. Uh, and there it is. You know, they're they're fighting, they're feuding, this and that. The whole country can go to hell. They don't care, because to them. The country is the nobles. I, I'm not being funny about this. When you said the Polish nation to the nobles, that was identical with the nobles. You understand? What's everybody else? They're the furniture in the nation, but the nation is the nobles. And of the nobles, only great magnets count. And so who gets to be the official commander in chief of the army, the hetman as they call them, who gets to be the you know, marshal of this and all these different offices? And they fought each other like crazy, and the country can go down the tubes. And it did. Meanwhile, the Jews are living there. <laughs> it's the largest Jewish community, and it's growing. All throughout the 1700s, the Jewish population was, 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 uh, had a significant baby boom. I'll tell you, like I mentioned the other day, Poland, I mean the old kingdom of Poland in Eastern Europe, is the only place in the diaspora that I know of that had ever had a baby boom. I mean over the 1500s and the 1600s and the 1700s and the 1800s. And that's including the high infant mortality because... Guess what? They didn't have amoxicillin in the, in the 18th century. Okay? So it was high infant mortality. This is the old days where all the Jews got married very young, and they all had children until they died. Which is, yeah, that, that, that's how life was. And uh, therefore, even though there was a you know, your, your fair share of persecution, and this, and that, and the other, but Paruva uh, that they became very large. And so, um, what happens with the Jews over here? Uh, they grow and grow, despite the petty despotism of the all-powerful magnates. If you're under the control of the nobleman, he can do whatever he wants with you. But usually, you know, let's put it this way. If you get him on a bad day, it's a bummer. <laughs> but otherwise, life goes on. Do we have famous descriptions that will take too long for me to describe? Here's Solomon Maimon was a Litvak who uh, became a Moscow in the late 1700s and moved from Lithuania to uh, Berlin. And then in other parts of Germany, he became a brilliant philosopher, believe it or not. Classic Moscow, you know, went to school or anything like this. And, he, you know, it was young, he, was, he knew how to learn uh, Gemara and Kabbalah and things like that. And he wrote before he died and became totally unfirm. And uh, he actually had a, a Prussian count who became a fan of his. And uh, he let him stay on his estates and uh, Count Kalkreutz. And he wrote a very famous autobiography in the 18th century style like Rousseau, which is you tell everything. Okay, tell all. And it's fascinating to read. It's a, it's a classic of world literature. Uh, you know, if you Google it, you'll find it. It's in the libraries and things like that. And he talks about, he's the first one to visit the Hasidim, for example. And he says, I grew up in Lithuania. My father had a uh, little uh, a concession from a nobleman about a bridge. And according to the lease, the nobleman was supposed to fix the bridge when it didn't work. 
and every time the bridge uh, fell in and people, uh, you know, the, the, the carriage fell down and they beat up my father and he kept saying, it's not my responsibility to fix the bridge, you know, and he kept getting beaten up. And when the noblemen's guys would show up, we all ran away for a day or two from the house and they would come in and uh, loot everything. And, uh, you know, in the middle of all this kind of mishigas, his father made a living. You get it? Every once in a while, something happened to the bridge and he was too stubborn to fix the bridge. So every once in a while, there, there's something happened bad and, you know, all the chickens and the cows were stolen and then you started all over again. And that's how life was lived. And that was considered a prosperous family in Lithuania, which was part of Poland back in the 18th century. If you're at all interested in this subject, I strongly recommend that you read this book. It's, uh, it's like reading Rousseau, but he's Jewish. You know? Now, um, anyhow, um, just like the Polacks had their politics, the Jews who lived in their own Jewish world had their politics. As a matter of fact, the 18th century, you have a lot of Jewish high politics. You have uh, Shabtai Tzviism, right? The 18th century is the, is the century of Sabatianism, like we talked about last summer, in Poland. Okay? And it's like McCarthyism. Are you really a Sabatian? And what's going on in your house behind closed doors? And what kind of a sitter do you really have? And do you eat, uh, you know, ritually trafe on Yom Kippur, I mean, or on the Tisha Bob or something like that? And everybody's suspecting everybody. Um, you had uh, the Emden Abishitz affair in the 1750s, that even though it took place in, when they accused the Emden Abishitz, it was a God of Lador being a Sabatian. So basically, Alger Hiss is a communist, you understand, like that. And, and everybody's like, well, it can't be, you know. So, Emerson uh, uh, Abschitz and, and Jakob Emden lived in Germany, but they're both Polish Jews. Okay? They both come from, from Poland. Uh, Jakob Emden born in Poland. Uh, they're both, and so is Abschitz, actually. And therefore, this controversy rages in uh, Poland with the Vada Abarazos, and each side tries to get the Polish government and other people to condemn the other side. So, what I'm trying to say is like this if you're Jewish and you live in the 1700s, there's plenty to talk about of Jewish politics. You understand? Besides what's going on in the outer world, there's plenty to talk about of Jewish politics. Then you had uh, the Frankism, right, which was not Sabatianism, but it was his own uh, Mishagas. And there, the Frankist, uh, this guy's basically the Mashiach. Okay? He's not a Sabatian, it's, uh, not at all, but uh, he had his own um, theology, shall we say. And uh, these guys are really into orgies and things like that, okay? That's what they're notorious for. And when the Orthodox Jews wanted to really go after him, they called in the Catholic Church, and they said, the Orthodox Jews, uh, the Talmud is anti-Christian. Uh, it's got bad references to Jesus and all the rest of it. Burn the Talmud. And they actually had an old-fashioned medieval disputation. This is very unusual in Poland, very unusual in Poland, that the Bishop of Brody... Uh, caused a public disputation to see if the Talmud was a trafe book or not. And the Jews were so angry at the Frankists for doing this. And at the end, the bishop condemned the Talmud. They said he got averted. The next day, he had a stroke and dropped dead. <laughs> you know? So all of a sudden, they said like this, we'll call that project off. You know? uh, I'm saying you, you can't make this up. And the Jews were so angry at the Frankists, they did, they're going to kill him no matter what. So the Frankists all mass converted to Christianity. They all became Catholics. Then you can't touch them, get it? Then you can't touch them. So you can be as angry as you want. And here you had the famous dissonance, which foreshadows Jewish politics ever since then. I'm talking about 1760, 1756, 1757, which foreshadows everything. Do you consider the defection of the Frankists and their conversion to Christianity a positive thing or a negative thing? Most from Jews says, to hell with them. Get rid you know, it's like getting rid of a cancer. It's good. It's great. They made parties. Goodbye, good luck, get out of here. You understand? Now you're not part of the, part of the Jews. Mm -hmm. Others, like the Baal Shem Tov, died from the grief. That's what they say. Because he said a Jew is a Jew, even the worst kind of Jew, as part of the limbs of Rabban Shalom, and all this kind of business. It's, uh, you know, all Kla Yisrael is one piece, and when something is, is, is terrible, I'll tell you a funny thing. When all these guys converted, it overloaded the noble system because the Jews supposed to become a noble when they convert. They have a mass number of all this kind of stuff, and you know, every Tom, Dick, and Harry is saying like this, <laughs> let me into the club, you know, literally. And so they freaked out over that. So there's plenty going on in the Jewish world. They don't have to worry about the Great Northern War or the Seven Years' War or that kind of business. And obviously the biggest fights of all are going to be in the middle of the 1700s, the Hasidim versus the Litvak versus the Mesnagdim, right? Because the Baal Shem Tov lives in the period I'm talking about. 
He lived in Poland in the 1700s. That's when he lived, like in the late 1690s till 1760. So he lived under Augustus the first, or Augustus the second, I should say, and Augustus the third. You know, that's exactly when he was there, when, the, when, the, when Poland was a crazy country and nobody's in charge of anything. That's exactly how Hasidus could take off. Nobody's in charge. So if you have a pietistic Jewish movement, which is not political against the government at all, correct? There's nothing in Hasidism that's against Poland. Really. You know, nothing about that. It's an internal Jewish uh, fight. So nobody stopped them. You get it? Nobody stopped them. Hasidism could, could spread like wildfire from what... Uh, I mean, it didn't happen overnight, but you start in Eastern, but in the Ukraine and places like that, and then moved elsewhere. There's plenty of John happening in the Jewish Dalanamas in Poland in the 1700s, totally aside from the fact that everybody does live in a country that's going through some pretty weird experiences and having no borders, no government, and, 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 and crazy rulers and all the rest of it. And uh, not only Hasidim, but you have the Misnagdim, okay? <laughs> I don't have to tell you. Okay, the Nevi who lived in Prague, but he was born in Poland in Sanz, in Sanz, and he uh, uh, went to his yeshiva and learned in Brody. So uh, Brody and Vilna are the two famous kloizes, kolels of yesteryear, where they put the cherem on the chazidim. So I'll just tell you right now, it's not even what to talk about. If you lived in a shul in Poland in the 1750s, 1760s, 80s times, when you walk in the shul, I know exactly what the hawk is going on. Right? He said, what's happening with the casino? What's happening with Frank and so? What's happening with this? What's happening with this? I heard four rumors. And by the way, there were no newspapers and no news. So everything's fake news, you know what I mean? So everybody's having a ball, you know? What's going on? People are yakking at the mikvah. People are yakking at the, when they're you know, lining up to buy Shabbos things, when they're, when they're doing business with each other and all the rest of it. This, so it's a very rich Jewish life in terms of having their own political world, as it were, even as they're totally aware, as they have to be, what's going on in Poland, because they live there, they pay taxes there, they're subject to the invasions, and they have to know what's going on. And like I showed you in the movie the other day from Mitzkiewicz, all the Jewish bartenders are listening to the Polacks talking about all the politics going on. What do you think they do? They keep it to themselves? You know, daddy goes to the barber and he says, what, what did the parrot say? He said, next week, so-and-so is going to get assassinated. Next week, this castle is going to be stormed by the other army. And all the rest of it. This is what goes, and the other guy said, no, my bartender told me it was something different, and all the rest of it, you have a machogas at a 7 Eleven. This is how, <laughs> this is how life was lived. I'll say it again, it's not that long ago. It's by great, 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 great grandparents, you know, something like that. Not that long ago. Um, and finally, you have the beginnings of the beginnings of the beginning of the Haskalah. Right? In Poland, it's very small. Germany was a little bit bigger. But you do have an element here and there, of people who uh, are already starting to question the cultural insularity, as we talked about last year, and the Gamar 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 business, as we talked about last year, and are looking for uh, you know, different uh, horizons, as they were, some from, some not from. And so Poland is a very lively uh, kind of place with every kind of uh, t flavor of ice cream that you want uh, during this period. Now, uh, Polish jewelry was cooking. And the main dynamic force, it's just interesting for us to think of the 1700s, when all this junk is going on, the main dynamic force without question is Hasidism, is Hasidus, correct? No question about it. Uh, the force that began to sweep the largest Jewish community of the 18th century was a movement not of materiality, but of spirituality. Isn't that interesting? The Polish Jews, the majority, I should say, are moving to the right, not to the left. This is the opposite of what happens elsewhere in the modern era. In the modern period, in Germany, in England, in France, and places like that, as we all know, everybody moves quicker or slower to the left. More modern, more secular, less insular, less religious, less observant, less this, that, and the other. What's happening in Poland? If you're joining the Hasidim, you're signing up for the opposite. More religious, more machmir, more narrow, more uh, intensely concerned with questions of ruchnius and spirituality in your life. What about all the scientific discoveries over there, sir? Eh, right? But then, that may be elsewhere, but in Poland, it's here. And I want to remind you, there are more Jews in Poland than all the others put together by far. By far. There were a million Jews in Poland at that time at least. Okay? And uh, after the first partition, they made a poll, 
in the leftover parts of Poland, and they said there were 900,000, uh, and that's in, assuming that they counted everybody, which I'm sure they didn't. And if you throw in the, you know, that's outside, besides Galicia and besides uh, the other territories they took over. So you put in, there's well over a million Jews, well over a million Jews in Poland. There's nowhere near that in Germany and France and England and Italy and all the other countries put together. Nowhere near that. So it's always a pet peeve of mine that people, when they write the books of modern Jewish history, they say everything moved to the left. And it's true, but that's very geographically specific. If you're talking about Eastern Europe, the movement is to the right, and uh, this is profound significance down to the present time. Because the two most powerful movements, I would argue, today in Jewry, they're not Reform Judaism, they're not conservative Judaism, they're not secular Judaism, they're not dynamic, powerful, growing movements. It's Hasidism and Yeshivaism. That's Poland, they're all from Poland in the 1700s. Hasidism is a Polish phenomenon. I know that you have Sephardic Hasidim now and you have African American Hasidim and all the rest, I'm aware of that. But it's a Polish, you know this, it's a Polish Yiddish speaking kind of business. Gare and Bells and all these other places are over there <laughs> in the old kingdom of Poland. It's not so clear where they are on the modern map because you've got to know how they redrew the boundaries of a lot of these places now in Ukraine or wherever. But it's the old kingdom of Poland. So uh, the only two, inst two institutions of long-term vibrancy and fecundity in the modern era would prove to be Hasidism and, and the, what eventually became the Lithuanian machines. That's a, quite a statement I just made. I don't know if you appreciate it. All the other movements proved episodic. They've come and gone. The, the great movements of yesteryear are pretty uh, weak today. Uh, it's what it is. By the 1760s, the national situation in Poland was dire in the extreme. When King Augustus died, the second idiot, Catherine the Great was the Empress of Russia. She's going to be a, a, play a big role in our story. Uh, Catherine the Great was a German prince who became the Empress of Russia by killing her husband and you know, maneuvering into politics and all the rest of it. And she played a very clever game over the course of 30 years, which resulted in the destruction and the disappearance of Poland. She played a, an interesting chess game, and she succeeded, which is why the Russians call her the Great. <laughs> okay? The Great. Um, the Poles were too stupid to prevent it. And here's the story that happened. Seven years earlier, when Catherine had been a princess in Russia, uh, she was a German little princess who married the heir to the Russian throne, who himself actually was a German prince. Because the, the Russians didn't have children, the, the former czars and all that stuff. And so her position was very precarious. There are movies and novels about this. Uh, because her husband was Peter III and he didn't like her. Uh, he may have had all kind of, who knows what kind of sexual issues, this and that and the other. Maybe yeah, maybe no. Bottom line is, she's a princess in Russia and she's not having any children. And the Empress of Russia, uh, Elizabeth, who also was no Tzadikus, so she says like this, she says, um, uh, you know, we brought you here to have heirs for the dynasty. So have a baby, I don't care what it takes. Meaning I don't care from whom. So that's what she said, okay. And the result is that uh, she started messing around with people for the rest of her life, actually. And one of her boyfriends was a Polish nobleman who was visiting in uh, Russia at that time named Stanislaw Poniatowski. Uh, Stanislaw Poniatowski. So he's one of her many uh, boyfriends. And then she became the empress and killed her husband. Uh, and the following year, after she became the empress, the Polish throne was up for election. That was the king died. And so she sent an army, plus a lot of bribe money, and got her boyfriend elected king of Poland. He's the last king of Poland, Stanislaus Poniatowski. And um, she hoped that he would be another doofus, but he was not. He was a very intelligent guy, but he wasn't strong character. He took his job seriously, but he was no John Sobieski, and that's what Poland needed. He was not that. So Stanislaus, who had been educated uh, uh, finely, and uh, he'd been, uh, had a spa from trips to England and France and Germany and Holland and Russia, very well, you know, once upon a time, what they call the Grand Tour, travel is an essential part of your education, which it should be, okay? Which it should be. You don't really, you know, have a broad view, certainly in terms of the liberal arts. If you don't get around and see different countries, different cultures. So he was like that. See, what I'm trying to say is this. He's not some Polak living in a tiny shtetl who will never walk three miles from his house. He wasn't a peasant, okay? And he sincerely wanted to reform the country. He said, everybody can tell that Poland is falling apart. So did many others. I mean, it was ridiculous already. Now we're in 1763, 1764. 
Um, the king, a foster, he, so he tried his best. He reminds me a little bit of Sitki or the king of Yehuda, you know, who was well meaning but weak. He fostered a Polish Enlightenment. He says there's a French Enlightenment, a German Enlightenment, and so he had a lot of uh, artists and writers and intellectuals. And he wrote to the French philosophers, uh, you know, Rousseau and the others, saying, give us suggestions how to reform Poland. Because we know our country is in bad shape. And you were the smart guys at that time, they thought. And what would you say? Uh, Rousseau later on wrote a constitution for Poland. The obvious necessary reforms were clear. Uh, share power with the non-nobles. It can't be just the nobles out the part of nobody else. And serfdom. Um, eliminate this... Uh, Liberum veto, the clause that says you, you have to have a unanimous vote to get a law passed. Uh, create a real central government with the necessary taxes. Spread literacy and education. Improve roads, bridges, infrastructure. Create a real army. You know, things like that. What we call a normal country. I didn't say anything genius, Nick. <laughs> ABCs, you'd think. Uh, precisely because these reforms were obvious, if Poland was again going to get its acts together, act together. Two groups opposed these reforms fiercely. One group were the great nobles, the magnates. That's push it, because they don't want a central government which takes away from their power and share the power with anybody else. They like it the way it is. It was a, for them, it was a golden age. That's one group. The other group who doesn't want Poland to get its act together are the neighboring countries. Prussia and Russia. They said, we want to keep Poland weak. And so what will they do during all these decades? We are the defenders of the historic Polish nobility, the act of Lublin and the golden freedoms and the rights of the nobles to have a liberum veto and all the rest of it. These are sacred. Really? How come in your country you're creating a total dictatorship, a centralized monarchy, all the rest of it? But for Poland, you're a tzaddik. Because the answer is it's absolute cynicism, and they made it their business to prevent any reforms of real meaning get, getting passed. They cynically posed to the other two. There's the Frederick the Great there and Catherine the Great. That's the trouble with Poland. They're stuck historically. They always say it. They got bad geography. Like Israel said, we got bad geography. On the one side is Russia, on the other side is Germany. You know, that's the classic uh, joke that I've heard in a hundred variations, but it's originally a Polish joke in which three people sitting on a park bench is a Pole, it's a German, it's a Russian. And a, a, a genie appears and everybody gets one wish. So the German says, wipe out Russia. And the Russian says, wipe out Germany. He says, your wish is granted. And the Polish says, I'll take a cup of coffee. You understand? Now, uh, uh, so this is the situation. So they cynically posed, thank you very much. They cynically posed as uh, the champions of Poland's historic liberties for the noble. Uh, Frederick the Great of all people. So, I told you, this is a story, this is a movie. Between the magnates, on the one hand, the great nobles of Poland, and the Prussians and the Russians, all attempts to reform the Constitution and fix the system were sabotaged. Okay? So Catherine the Great, as you see, is a, is a great enemy of Poland. Because she's always saying, no, I won't let you do this, I won't let you change this, I won't let you fix that. Uh, as the Polish intellectuals, because they had people with college education, they had writers, they had people traveling in other countries, they weren't stupid. They weren't stupid. You know, they saw what's going on. As Polish int uh, intellectuals discussed various changes, they ignored one big issue, and that was the non-Poles who live in Poland, which was a problem, because Poland had a lot of people that are not Polish. I'll give you an example, the Ukrainians, is a giant group. Who was Khmelnytsky, if not that? You see? You have many other groups as well. Uh, the minorities, like the Ukrainians, the Protestants, by this time, Poland was overwhelmingly Catholic, and the non-Catholics were, were persecuted. I'll give an example. In the Ukraine, it was Greek Orthodox. The Greek Orthodox churches were seized and given to the Catholics. Uh, Orthodox priests were molested. There were a lot of what we call Edgar Mart Mortara cases, in which young children were taken from the Ukrainian parents and sort of kidnapped by the Poland and raised as a Catholic. So those Poland did outrageous things. They did outrageous it because the nobles could do whatever they wanted. And the local priest tells you, go for it, baby. You'll get a ticket into heaven if you forcibly convert a Greek Orthodox kid or a Protestant kid into Catholic. Uh, all these groups were, were uh, pretty badly treated, except the Jews. 
Isn't that funny? They didn't go after the Jews because the Jews are not Christians. So it's not a question of converting them. It's funny, right? The Jews are the furniture, like we saw in the movie. Now, of course, they wanted to convert Jews. And if they got one, it was a big deal and all the rest of it. But they didn't go and say, let's close down all the synagogues and all this kind of stuff. Because the nobleman owns the town. The synagogue is his. The Jews are his, all the rest of it. These are the bees that produce the honey, so leave them the heck alone. Anyway, Jews are junk, so who cares about them, you know? And the Jews are like, it's great, great, you know? No problem. Uh, the problem is now, let me put it this way. This was a very unhealthy situation because he, who are they persecuting? The Protestants and the Greek Orthodox. So the Greek Orthodox live over here. Who's on the other side of that border? Russia. The Protestants live over here in Germany. Who's on the other side of the border? Prussia. So it's tailor-made for Catherine the Great. So he goes, oh, you're persecuting my fellow co-religionists. We can't allow that. We have to go and rescue them. And Frederick the Great said, oh, you're persecuting the fellow Protestants. Again, now what they really want to do is you know, take over Poland. And so the result is that the Protestants have a friend in, Pro in Prussia and the Ukrainians have a friend in Russia. If persecutions and discriminations do not cease, it will produce an excuse for Russian and Prussian troops to invade Poland. That's eventually what happened. Now, why weren't the Poles smart enough to see that you better liberalize and stop mistreating your religious minorities for your own national interests? The answer is the smart Poles realize it, but the extreme right wing, I come back to that over and over again, the extreme right wing uh, wouldn't give an inch, and they caused all the trouble. Um, in 1766, that's two years after this guy became king, England, Russia, Prussia, Denmark, send a petition to the same, to the Polish parliament, for religious liberty for the Greek Orthodox and the Protestants. But the same, influenced by the Catholic clergy, said no, they rejected this. Now, the king, Stanislaus, and the other liberals realized it, and they tried to push for a law providing religious liberty and equality, that kind of thing. Because they said, we got to, otherwise the country would be taken over. But the extreme right wing defeats this attempt and even tried to punish those who, pro who were proponents of it. This led to, leads to Protestant nobles, because there were nobles who were all the way in the German side, near Germany, who were, who were Protestant, to form a confederacy at Torn, uh, right near the Prussian border. In the Polish constitution, I mean the old, old one, if the nobles don't like what the government does, they're allowed to form a confederacy in rebellion. Isn't that weird? It's part of the, the liberties of the nobles. It's, it's, it's crazy. Uh, anyhow, so what was the result? At the next session of the parliament, the leading Catholic bishops opposed liberalization, and the Russian ambassador just went and arrested them and took them to Siberia. Here's Prince Repnin, who was the Russian, Catherine the Great's ambassador. He said, I got the soldiers. What are you going to do about it? You want to go to war with Russia? So you see what's happening, right? And basically, they're, they're tottering on the brink, and they don't, they, don't, they don't see it. At the point of a bayonet, Prince Repnin, the Russian ambassador, forces the same to pass the liberalization law. He says, you're passing this law to give the Greek Orthodox and the Protestants, or nobody's leaving this building alive. Right-wing Catholics are enraged. They formed the Confederacy of Bar. Bar was a, a fortress. And they raised an army, and they tried to ride the Russians out and restore illiberalism. You know what I said? They tried to restore Catholic non-liberalism, because that's the heart of Poland, <laughs> the old Poland. And uh, now the situation goes crazy on international scale, because the Russian army comes in, they defeat the Confederacy. They chase them into Turkey. They burn down a Turkish city. Turkey declares one Russia. The Ukraine, the whole area of eastern Poland is, is, is one big crazy war zone. The Ukrainians, seeing this as an opportunity, start another Khmelnytsky riot, uh, ma massacres, killing tens of thousands of Catholics and Jews. It's what I showed the other day. That's why Nachum Breslover went to Uman, because Uman was a town, unfortunately, where these new Khmelnytsky types attacked and stormed and, and massacred everybody. There were other places as well. So there were huge mass graves in uh, these areas. It was a big war. Now, the Catholic, if you follow what I just said, it's, it's like a chess game. The Catholics in Poland hoped that Turkey would win the war against Russia. Does that make sense? Do you get that? Because if Turkey beats the Russians, the Russians get off our back and we can go be non-liberal. But Russia beat Turkey. That's what we call Catherine the Great. She, was, uh, she had a great uh, military. And uh, uh, what do you call it? She, her general, uh, let's go ahead. Uh, these are famous people from yesterday, Rumantsev and others. They conquered you know, the Crimea and down to the Nesta River. They, they won a lot of victories over the Turks. This is when, this, when the Ottoman Empire really starts going down the tubes. Go to the next one. Catherine the Great sent in the 17th century 
a navy, a Russian navy, which bombarded Beirut. <laughs> that means they had to sail navy, you know, from the Baltic all the way down the Mediterranean and over to here. I mean, think about that. So the Turks said, whoa. Uh, at this point, Russia looked like it was going to totally knock out Turkey and take it over. Uh, they totally beat the, and, and look, let's go to the next map. The Russians were in a role. They might conquer all of this. And in which case, Austria and Prussia freaked out. If Russia has all of this, they can attack us. And so Prussia and Russia say, let's join together to fight Russia to save Turkey. Don't you love uh, old-fashioned balance of power politics? Uh, because otherwise, if, if Russia saw Turkey, it would be a, a problem for us. In order to avoid a major European war, Frederick the Great, who had just gone through a huge war, the Seven Years' War, uh, sends his brother to St. Petersburg. Prince Henry of Prussia. Since it's the 4th of July, I'll tell you a detail that no one will ever know. Prince Henry of Prussia was supposed to be the king of the United States of America. So what am I talking about? After the after American Revolution was over, they had the Articles of Confederation. Nobody knew what to do. Everything was falling apart. The one obvious answer was get a king. Get a king. So the President of the United States, whose name I think was Thomas Gorham, Obviously, I'm talking about the George Washington. I'm talking about before George Washington, the president of the Continental Congress, uh, maybe on the 4th of July of 1784, said, uh, this guy be, make a very good king, <laughs> right? And let's get, he wrote back, he says, I'm here if you want me. Uh, yeah, well, I don't know what it would be, uh, because he was a great general, but he was gay as a goose. So American history would be very interesting. But all I can tell you is that as we know, thank God he got George Washington instead. But anyway, um, he was a prince of Prussia, and he went to St. Petersburg, and he said to the Empress Catherine, why should we fight? Let's just agree to take a slice of Poland, and everybody be happy. Get it? Why, 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 why? I won't take a lot of turkey. Don't take too much out of turkey. Take a, like a tiny little bit, and take a nice slice of, of Poland. I'll take a slice, too. You see? Well, I'll be happy, you know? You like salami, don't you? Everybody wants a piece. Um, now, Catherine the Great said like this, sounds good, uh, Poland cannot stop us from annexing slices of Poland. They don't have the military power to stop us. And so, little by little, they said, well, yeah, but Austria will feel left out and they might side with Poland. Let's give Austria a slice. And so, if you want to be in 1771, the letters are going back and forth between the three royal courts, the court of Prussia in Berlin, Court of Austria in Vienna and the Court of Russia in St. Petersburg. Should we do it? How much? What does everybody get? You understand? And uh, this is the Empress Maria Theresa and her son Joseph II, who were the co-rulers of the Austrian Empire at that time. They had lost uh, some of Germany to Frederick the Great, so they wanted the uh, compensation. You know, here you can just take it out of Poland. You see, uh, Catherine the Great naturally wants a slice. And Frederick the Great, he wanted, the, if you look at the old maps of Prussia, it's like interrupted by Poland, therefore he wants the, the part in the middle, so it'll all be contiguous. And let's put it this way, everybody will be happy, no wars, Shalom al Yisrael, everything will be great. And the Poles, they deserve it, you know what I mean? And so, uh, now, I want to point out, Frederick the Great was a Protestant, so he didn't like Catholic Poland. Catherine the Great was a Greek Orthodox, she did, Russian Orthodox, she didn't like Catholic Poland. Maria Theresa, the Empress of Austria, was a Catholic. So she couldn't say she didn't get Catholic Poland. She said, this is not right. right? This is a, a robbery. But her son said, I guess the others are doing this. So he might say, if we don't take it, then, you know, uh, we'll just look stupid. And so in the end, she, you know, reluctantly, she did it. Frederick the Great famously said, she cries, but she takes. <laughs> Has it? El pan means el pan, or something like that. Um, so she said, so the, in February of 72, 1772, Prussia and Russia signed a treaty allowing each other to take a slice. And in August, after six months of persuasion, Maria Theresa reluctantly agreed. So the three armies just marched in, announced annexation, and set up new borders. Okay? This is what you call the rape of Poland in history. They call the rape of Poland. Might makes right. And technically speaking, it's called the first partition of Poland. What does that mean? Poland wasn't partitioned. Each one took a part. So this is Galicia. Joseph II and Maria Theresa took that. So from now on, from 1772 until the First World War, the end of the First World War, Franz Josef times, the Galicianers, raise your hand if you're a Galician. No, don't. He says, uh, <laughs> there's one. The, uh, uh, wait a second. 
That's why they're always a separate part of Poland. They're under Austria. They're subject to a particular uh, administration, as we'll see next week, and a particular culture. And so I'll give you an example. If you ever go to Lemberg, Lvov, where I was last summer, I was amazed. Uh, it's all Western buildings. And they say, yeah, the Austrians want to make a second Vienna. And they kind of did. So, you know, we're Americans. We don't, unless you go there and see it, you know, how would you, you know that? Looks very much like the Venus type place, right? Uh, they tried to Germanize it. We'll talk about that later. Uh, Frederick the Great took this. I told you, he used to have this and this. So he took the part in the middle. So he didn't partition Poland, he took part of Poland. And Catherine the Great, look how modest she is. She only took that. But of course, she was planning long term. That's the four spies, as they say, you know, when the main course will come later. The main course will come later. Um, and so what we're dealing with is an act of unprecedented cynicism. They said, you know, we're going to protect the religious minorities and we're helping Poland get its act together. Here's a famous map from yesteryear. There's Maria Theresa, there's Joseph, there's Joseph, there's, I forget, that's Frederick the Great. And I forget who this is. And, you know, they're all playing over the maps of, uh, of, of Poland. And the international politics was such that England and France couldn't intervene. And so they got away with it. They got away with it. The Poles were shocked, but powerless. No, now they realize, gee, maybe we should have passed that law ourselves, <laughs> you know, for the Protestants and the, and, and the Orthodox. But they had to agree to the annexations. What could they do? Uh, so from now on, the area around Danzig will be German, even though really it isn't. Now, today, by the way, it's not that way. When they redrew the map after the Second World War, we'll see a lot of stuff, the maps changed. But I'm talking about for a long, long time, it wasn't that way. Why am I going through all this? If you're Jewish, it all depends on the luck of dice. If you're a Polish Jew, did you end up in the Prussian part? Now you're going to have to grow up to be German. Did you end up in the Russian part? You're going to be subject to those influences. If you end up in the Galicia part, then you'll be half, you know, half, half Austrian, half uh, Yiddish, half Hasidic there. So it used to be one country of Poland. No, it's not. It's just different experiences, even though really it's the same Jews. Correct? I mean, a girl from here will marry somebody from there. They'll sneak over the border. I'm serious. Correct? And somebody from here will go, will go there. But that's coming in a few minutes. How did all this affect the Jews? Well, first of all, the Jews in the new territories, like Galicia, for example, now encounter, encounter for the first time real countries, real states, bureaucratic absolutist states, which they're not used to where everything, including everything Jewish, is now subject to minute government regulation. Not good for the Jews. Okay? I mean, Joseph II is going to put in regulations about a Shabbos candles, how much taxes you have to pay to buy them, and all this kind of business. It's going to be really big. The Jews did not like it at all. What happened to the good old Poland? Nobody was in charge. We just paid the noblemen what it is, and we all went in our merry way. Right? Aye, the bridge collapsed. I'd rather have the bridge collapse and not have the German, uh, you know, administrators and all that stuff, the Russians. Internally, this is very interesting, the partition I just described af affected the Hasidism wars because it was in 1772, this very year, that the Visnagdim felt so strongly about the new Hasidic movement, it reached a boiling point. The Baal Shem Tov died in the old Poland in 1760. The Magad of lived in the last years of the old Poland. From 1760, he was running around till, well, he wasn't running, he was in bad feet, but he was in operation from 1760 to 1772. So literally in all these chaotic years, okay? And he was in eastern Poland, so they didn't feel it too much. But in, he died in uh, the end of 72. In uh, Pesach of 72, 1772, that's when the famous cherems came out. In uh, both, what, uh, does the Vilna go in, of course? The cherem put in Vilna and down here in Brody in the northwest and the southeast of Poland, in which they said that this new Hasidic movement is a heresy movement, and it's terrible, it's not a shop Tai Chi business, and all the rest of it, people have to be suppressed and worse, and so on and so forth. Um, listen closely what I'm about to tell you. Once upon a time in Poland, such a public excommunication would have worked, but not in 1772, because eight years earlier, in 1764, when this new king, Stanislaw Poniatowski, was elected at that parliament, that same, they, they, they abolished um, the Vada Baruxas. Okay, They abolished the famous National Jewish Council that theoretically is supposed to run all the Jewish affairs and, and in reality was in charge of the Jewish taxes. 
Uh, we'll see soon why. As a result, by the time you get to 1772, a cherem has nothing to back it up. There's no Vadabarotsas out there. It's just some people's opinion. There's no physical, legal power behind it. Once upon a time, the Jewish communities had a power. They could seize you, go and kill you, but they could do everything but. They could beat you up, put you in the stockade, put you in the stocks, you know, like, like you see in Williamsburg, uh, in jail. Uh, they could do a lot of things to you. Uh, and that's how they suppress Sabatianism, among other things. Can't do anything now but the Hasidim. Now, if you're a Hasid, you say he's a Minna Shalai, you know. He's a, because all of a sudden, Poland's falling apart, there's no Vada Abaratzas, Jewish communities don't count. And Mezerich is over here, the part just taken over by Catherine the Great, so you can't touch him. Because the Russian is state is a state. There are no harems in our country. You understand? Know the only harem that counts is the Tsar. And so this profoundly uh, 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 affected them. Uh, as I said before, the um, ban, the harem, was in Pesach. The annexation by the Russian army was in also about a month later. Uh, the Magad of Mezrich told his students a famous story, don't put a counter harem against them, it's not them, but they did anyway, and they say he died from Agmas Nefesh, and he died, of course, on uh, Yotes Kislev, which <laughs> is Lubavitch holiday, for a variety of reasons. One of the reasons is the death of the Magad of Mezrich. So all I'm trying to say is the partitions that I just described helped the Hasidic movement. As I said, the Vada Baratza was abolished by the Polish Enlightenment, but why did they do that? Here, unfortunately, you have a tale of Polish as well as Jewish history. After the Poles got over their shock at being raped, here's a famous painting where they hear the news that they have to give up part of their country, um, a consensus formed among many, not all, that it was time for Poland to wake up and smell the coffee. Change was a vital necessity. Okay? Because you see, the, the, the Russians and the, everybody's taking over. A reform movement started in the 1770s to try to fix things somewhat. Here's a famous description. Look at this. A wave of reforms by progressive magnates in this family and the king introduced the most important. They made a ministry of education to try to set up a public school system in 1773. Look at that. Uniform textbooks and things like that. They tried to make an army and military to be uh, fixed up. Economic commercial reforms and to cover the military budget were introduced. A new government. Uh, this is like a shock. You have a national cabinet. <laughs> Never had that before. A 36-member permanent council, five ministries, power. They, in other words, they tried to, 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 to take steps to become a somewhat normal state. There was even a move for more sweeping modernization changes by somebody who was an anomaly. Let's go to the next one, by Zamoyski, who really wanted to put in, uh, to make the country like England or France or something like that, a real, a real genuine government. But these changes were opposed always by the magnates and also by the rapists by Prussia and Russia. And they couldn't get passed into Parliament in the same. So you see the 1780s and 1770s were a time of flux when reform and change were in the air, and many Poles, including the nobles and the intelligentsia, the educated people, began to systematically think about, among other things, all kind of problems in Poland. And the first problem was the army. The second problem was this. But somewhere along the line, like the French Revolution, the Jews. It's not the only item on the agenda, but it's one of the items on the agenda, because we got a million people over here that don't look like us. You know, like, what is this? Okay? Uh, the million Jews, or nearly a million Jews remaining in Poland, 13% of the population of leftover Poland, meaning after you deduct the Galicia and the other areas. That's a big percentage. The United States, we don't have 13% of the population are Jewish. We're not even a percent, I think, or whatever. You know? The, I mean, consider 13% uh, of the population. And so, wait a minute, uh, what do you do with all this kind of people? There's a proportion like nowhere else on earth. The fact that the Poles started to think of what to do with the Jews, that was bad for the Jews. Mm -hmm. The old neglect, uh, benign neglect, as the expression used to be, that period is coming to an end. Uh, until now, the Jews have pretty much been left to themselves and neglected that way. Now the Poles started to think of Jews as a national problem from the Polish point of view, which you can understand. It's a very large group, totally non-Polish in every way, who controlled... 75% of the exports. <laughs> Think about that. You know what I just said? That's the whole economy. 75% right? of the exports and like 15% of the imports, and they ran at all the 7-Elevens in the country. So we saw that. So now, truth to tell, it's a sad story, 
Because you know the old expression, be as Christian as the way the Christians go, that's what the Jews eventually do. The American Jews copy the Americans, the German Jews copy the Germans. And in Poland, they copied the Poles, the irresponsible rule of the Polish nobles, who imposed a burden, a heavy burden on everybody but themselves, was sadly copied by the Jewish nobles, meaning the rich Jews, who acted outrageously in the manner of Kehillah affairs, running the Kehillos from the black into the red. This degenerated all too often into a reign of terror by the rich and the powerful for Polish Jews. The 1700s was a sad period in Jewish history, if you want to be honest about it, in Poland, the largest and freest Jewish community. Jews did not do a good job with the freedom. Okay? Take a look at this. It's from the classic Dubno. The oppression of the Kehillo oligarchy went to such lengths that the suffering masses, unmindful of the traditional prohibition to appeal to the Erkos, because you're not supposed to go to a Polish court, but the Jewish courts they held were so corrupt and so into the rich, frequently sought to retrain, obtain a redress from the Christian administration against the Jewish satraps. So it's pretty sad if you got to go to a Polish court because the local people who run your kale, the rabbi and the community, all the rather others, are corrupt and on the take. But it happened. In 1782, representatives of the lower classes, artisans of the Jewish population of Minsk, lodged a complaint with the Lithuanian Financial Tribunal against the college administration, which was ruining the community. So that's pretty sad. You, you, you have to go to the Goyim and say, we want you to help us because the Jews, the rich Jews running this place, are doing a reign of terror on us, okay? Taking all the money from us. They're not taxing themselves. They're taxing everybody else. And they're ta overtaxing them. They allege that the Kahal leaders uh, embezzled the receipts from the taxation and misappropriated the surplus from their own benefit by means of using a cherem. They squeezed all kinds of revenues from the poor and appropriated their hard-earned pennies. Now, this doesn't happen in America, but, you know, it, <laughs> it happened over there. The complainants add, for their, uh, add that for their attempt to lay bare the true doings of the Kahal before the administration, they've been arrested, imprisoned, pilloried in the synagogue by order of the Kahal Gaboim. So it's the old fashioned thing. Instead of dealing with the problem, you try to suppress it. Um, this is why, th let's put it this way this is the, this is the ugly face of the Kahal. But it's not unknown in Jewish history. Keep going. In Vilna, the capital of Lithuania, celebrating the account of its aristocracy of mind and birth. A split occurred within the ranks of the Kahal oligarchy itself. And this was a famous Kahal Hashem. Namely, for nearly 20 years, there was a conflict between the rabbi, a certain Shemuel ben Avigdor, and the Kahal, or more, more correctly, between the rabbinical party and the Kahal party. So in other words, a rich guy got his son-in-law stepped in to be the chief rabbi of Vilna and using all kind of bribery and politics like to, to, to get him voted in, even though he knew a lot of people didn't like him, okay? But he's in. Now he's the odd base in Avila. The So people couldn't stand it. So two f factions formed. Wait a minute. The rabbi convicted of corruption, drunkenness, biased legal decisions, perjury, and so on. I'm not sure if that's true, but it might be. There's a question about it. Anyway, the litigation between the rabbi and Kahal had in an earlier stage been submitted to a court of arbitration as well as the conference of the rabbis. They tried to keep it in-house with a basin. You know, go to Basin of America, Basin of Lithuania. Since the strife and agitation in the city did not subside, they appealed in 1785 to Rajaville, the governor of Vilna, who decided favor to Kahal and dismissed the rabbi from office. So Enoch Abizayin got him, he said, Vilna, in the time of the Vilna Gon, which is supposed to be such a boom thing and all the rest of it, they went to the air coast. They went to the Polish uh, nobleman, right, who ran the place, the Voivoda, the, the governor, and they said, you're fair, you settle this because the Jews among themselves can't settle this. What do you do with that? The common people standing between the two belligerent parties were particularly bitter towards the Kahal, whose abuses and misdeeds exceeded all measure. A little later, in 1786-88, a champion of the people's cause appeared in the person of Simon Volfovich, who acted as spokesman of the masses of Vilna, and he had to struggle and suffer on their behalf. To ward off the persecution by Kahal, he managed to obtain an iron letter from the king guaranteeing the inviolability of person and property to himself and the whole Jewish community. So basically what we call today, what's that, uh, you know, uh, don't touch me. Yeah, or, or a restraining order. That's right. Uh, and uh, this did not prevent the authorities from subjecting him to the harem and entering his name in the black book, while the boyhood who sided with the tyrants sent the mutinous champion to the prison. Uh, from there, the prisoner addressed his memorandum to the Diet, the Polish parliament, emphasizing need for a radical change in communal organization of Jews 
the abolition of Kal power, which pressed so heavily upon the people, the common people shook to its foundations, the social before the incorporation into... Right? Now, by the way, these people are from the Shem Shabbos and all the rest of it, but you, you can be corrupt no matter what. And, you can, and you, can, you, you can arrogate the power to yourself and misuse it no matter what. So if it were po- it's just the way it goes. If it were possible in America for people to have this kind of power, they would use it because it just goes with the money. It just goes with the power. It goes with the office. You understand? And instead of being transparent, you become the opposite and how the money is spent and how you assess the taxes and all the rest of it, you do it in such a way that you don't get taxed and the other one gets taxed. It was a terrible kind of a business. Is that the end of it? Is that what we have? There's one more. A somber picture of a somber picture of the communal oligarchy is supplied by one of the broad-minded rabbis that appeared. I think it's Menashe Eli, if I remember correctly. The leaders consume the offerings of the people and drink wine for the fines imposed upon them, being in full control of the taxes. They assess and excommunicate their opponents. They remunerate themselves from public for public activity by every means they're disposed openly in secret. They make no step without accepting bribes. With the death, uh, yes. well, the, the destitute carry the burden, the learned cater to the rich, and it's for the rabbis, they only have contempt for one another. The students of the Talmud uh, uh, despise those involved in Kabbalah, while the common people expect, uh, accept the testimony of both. Anyway, you get the picture. Uh, so it wasn't great. Let's put it this way if Poland was in a rotten state, the Jewish communities were not in such a great state necessarily. Now, this is a very black picture. And it's not totally representative, obviously, of everything going on in Poland, but you had a lot of that. You had a lot of that. And uh, let me tell you right now, um, it was this problem that led the Polish government to abolish the Vada Baratzes because the Poles realized, and I'll put it to you in very simple terms, the Poles realized that the Kahillas were really corrupt. If a tax required for the Kahillas was $500,000 for the Polish government, the Kahillas would tax its members $750,000 claiming it was taxes for the Polish government, okay? This is besides the money that you need for the local Kihila, uh, you know, uh, expenses. What did they do with the extra 250? Yeah. We've never heard of that in Baltimore, right? Uh, they would pocket the money for themselves. This is unbelievable Kihil Hashem, I'm describing. Now, the Poles were not such tzaddikim. Their attitude is if that's what's happening, then the tax should be raised to 750, okay? And so the same... They decided to abolish the Jewish middleman, the Vada Baratzes. For now on, the Polish Treasury Department would make its own census and assessments, and obviously that would be bad for the Jewish taxpayers. Because at the end of the day, you don't get any relief, you just get the 750, which is more than you can bear, and it goes straight to the government, so you can't complain about it. It's a mess. Uh, indeed, extreme dissatisfaction with corrupt Kahila leadership was the reason for the spread of Hasidism, according to one famous historian from a uh, hundred years ago, Ben Sia Dinur. It's considered oversimplified, obviously. I mean, that's not the reason I've seen it spread. But so it's, it's, it's part of the story. No question about it. Okay? Because let me put it this way. How do you opt out of your local Kehillah? You can't. But mentally you can. You join the Hasidic groups, and now I'm stuck here, and i got to pay tax over here, but my real Kehillah is with this Rebbe somewhere else, who I really feel a Kesha with. Okay? Who I really, that, that's real. This is institutional authority, which is therefore corrupt. That's um, charismatic authority, and at least if I'm a chassid of the person, it's not corrupt. You see? So uh, there's a lot of social and political factors going on in Poland of yesteryear. The problem is, will the cure be better than the sickness? Will the projected reforms in the Jewish situation improve matters for the Jews or the opposite? The answer is the opposite. This is the Moisky guy I showed you before. Let's go to the next one. The famous uh, uh, nobleman. Now that they want to say, let's figure out how the Polish government rationally should ra- regulate the Jewish situation, he wants to do a Frederick the Great, who was terrible to his Jews. Basically, every Jew, this is his proposal, every Jew should be a, a, a form a, a productive uh, service. He should be an artisan, a farmer, or something like that. And the other Jews should be kicked out of Poland. Because that's what they did in Prussia and the German states. If you couldn't pay your way, you're thrown out. Really? Where are you going to throw the Jews out of Poland? <laughs> where, where, where are you going to throw the Jews out of Poland? Where would they go? I mean, I guess they could have gone to Turkey, but that would, that, that, that's be what, what, what it would be. Um, so it was really bad. Other Poles and Maskelyne wanted to reform the Jewish religion to make it more Polish. Come in the 1700s. Others simply wanted to reform the system of Chinuch to give them a secular education. All, all of these guys wanted to suppress Hasidism because that's the opposite. It's growing like wildfire, and they're, they're, they're too from, and they're too this, and they're too that. 
And I want to understand, do understand the Polish point of view. It's our country. What's this group here? Maybe they started coming 200 years ago, a few here and a few there to help the nobles. But now they're all over the place. They're getting bigger all the time. The Poles are, are complaining. So the Jews have child marriage. Therefore, everybody has 10 kids. But part of it is, so it sounds like they're complaining today. It's the welfare, you know what I mean? Now, there's no welfare at that time, but it's the fear of the spread of the other. And it's not their country. It's Poland. And the Jews are not Poles. So you can't hear what they're saying. It was increasingly no longer the good old Poland. Meanwhile, public opinion crystallized in Poland to bring our story to its final and tragic conclusion in the so-called four-year same or parliament of 1788-1792. The international situation seemed favorable. Here we go back to the politics. Russia and Austria were both involved in another war against the Turks. The new parliament ordered the Russian army out. Okay? Drafted a constitution and finally gave the middle class, the non-nobles, not the peasants, but the non-nobles, equal power with the nobles. They finally shared power. Okay? Peasants, though not freed of serfdom, were declared to be human beings, which is a big step forward in Poland. Okay? Peasant, um, more importantly, the liberum veto, the, the uh, unanimous clause was abolished, finally. And the same became much more of a parliament. With a normal parliament, they wanted to raise an army of 100,000 men. That's a real country, all right? Supported by normal taxation. In other words, Hefkerus was supposed to be replaced now by Seder. This is called the Constitution of 1791, May 3rd, 1791. The relative empowerment of the urban middle class, obviously, is because at that time the French Revolution is happening. And a few weeks ago, I did with you the French Revolution in which the middle class got the power in Paris. You know, the people used to be in France also, all the nobles had all the power. And then violently, this was overthrown. So now a lot of Poles are looking at France and they say, let's do the same thing. What about the Jews? Well, the, the same never got around to that. They kind of did, but never, not really. The French had emancipated the Jews and made the Jews complete and total citizens. We did this, like I say, what was it, a month ago, whatever, in 1791. But the French did so reluctantly, didn't they? Remember that? Uh, in the context of assimilating the Jews. Was this philo-Semitism? Not really. Remember what Clermont Tonnerre says? He said the Jews are denied everything as a nation, but granted everything as individuals, meaning you can have civil rights if you stop being this Jewish clannish business with your own communities and your own, you know, hanging together. You got to really become Frenchman. So if you would tell a Pole, an enlightened Pole, if you really become Polish, you can be part of us. And I'm not sure that would work either, but that's what they said in the 1790s. That's something. How many Jews in the time of the rise of Hasidism are going to switch over and become Polish? You know, what's the chances of that? Um, it's tough. Many Polish Enlightenment writers felt the same. Civil rights for the Jews, if the Jews change their dress, their language, their eating habits, give them the tavern business and become farmers. Well, with friends like this, uh, you know, you don't need enemies. These Polish idiots didn't stop to ask themselves, the Jews are a problem, how come they're causing all the exports? The exports is what's keeping the economy going. Isn't that true in every country? What's keeping the economy going? It's the exports, correct? The Jews are making all the exports, and the exports are good, so how are the Jews the problem? Maybe the nobles and the dumb Polacks are the problem. They're not doing anything for the economy. No, that you don't ask. Yeah. See, that you don't ask. And the reason is, we're the natives. See? The Jews are in Gaulus. They're not in Gaulus. We're the natives. For better or worse, it's our country. So we run it well, we run it not well. We don't have to run it well for it to be our country. You see? But you guys, <laughs> it's not your country. So are you a benefit to it or not? That's always the trouble with Gaulus. A number of Moschilic authors, Jewish guys, agreed with the anti-Semitic pamphleteers, you know, the Jewish anti-Semite, the usual type. Uh, on the other hand, the king and his prime minister, or his personal secretary, I should say, did try to mediate between the burghers of the free towns, meaning the cities who hated the Jews, because only the nobles had been good to the Jews, and the Jews to try to develop an intelligent policy. Here's poor King Stanislaus is trying to say, can't we work something out over here? The Jews should live in the city, but pay the taxes and do this and that and the other. Uh, but it didn't work. The burghers were a bunch of mumsers, and they said, we're no Jews anywhere, can't do anything, can't live in this town, can't engage in any business, can't do anything, they can all drop dead tomorrow. Uh, he, the, it's the king's uh, uh, personal secretary, Catholic, Italian guy, Catholic priest. The Vatican hated him because he was a left-winger. What does it mean, a left-winger in the 1790s? He thinks Jews should have, should have some rights. <laughs> Not civil rights, God forbid. A little rights. <laughs> okay? Uh, Scipione uh, Piatoli. In the event, the whole thing turned into a case, as we come to the end, of arguing over the proper arrangement 
of the dead shares on the Titanic. Because here we are in 1791, 1792. Guess what? Poland's about to leave the scene. Catherine the Great defeated the Turks badly, and then she turned her attention to get revenge on Poland. It wasn't hard. A bunch of right-wing Polish nobles, idiots, opposed to the new reforms, formed an alliance, one of these confederacies in a famous town called Targowice on the eastern side of Poland. Unbelievably, they asked Catherine the Great for help. They thought she'll help them restore the old Poland. What did she do? She helped them to doom. The Russians helped all right. A Russian army invaded Poland, defeated the Poles, and then compelled them to agree to another rape. And so you have what you call the second part of partition of Poland. Russia takes this, and Prussia takes this. This is all that's left of Poland, what I'm pointing to in the middle. Okay? So there's the first partition, there's the second partition. And Austria didn't count so at that time, so they got nothing. So this is all that's left of the once big uh, Poland. The Poles should have asked, uh, learned their lesson and asked, asked, acted meekly. But to tell you the truth, the Russians were, were intending to turn the screws. I mean, let's look at the next map. Look how much land they had lost. This is what they started with. They lost this and all of this from the first and second partition. They should have been very careful how they played their cards. But enraged Polish patriots, led by a genuine hero, Kosciuszko, you know him from the American Revolution? What is Kosciuszko famous for in the American Revolution? He was the number one engineer of the American army. He built the West Point. He built a lot of fortresses and dams and bridges and things like that. So a Pole came, who had no formal education came to this country and he was the one who saved the American army at Saratoga and a bunch of other places uh, by his engineering skill. Isn't that funny? So uh, that's why you have all these places in America named after Kosciuszko or as they say in New York, Kosciuszki. <laughs> right. Because they can't pronounce it. You know the famous story, the Irish cop in 1900, uh, a horse dropped down on Kosciuszki Bridge. He had to write a report. So he kept trying to spell it, you know. Finally gave up, picked up the horse, put on Second Avenue, said the horse died on Second Avenue. Because <laughs> what do you want, Kosciuszko, you know? Anyway, Kosciuszko, when he came back to Poland, he already had been infected by American liberalism, by democracy, by Republican spirit, and all the rest. He was a friend of Thomas Jefferson, for example. You understand? And I'll tell you something else, by the way. He was an early advocate for civil rights. This is just interesting. Now, I'm telling you this, you go look it up on your own if you're interested. His personal aide was a free black man from Massachusetts. His name was Hall, I think. And um, a group of Hall. And uh, he learned to respect black people. And so he left in his will when he died. He said the money should go to free slaves and things like that. Uh, so he was quite a, quite a guy. He came back and he saw the Russian situation and he said, this is terrible, and Poland has to go to war and try to re retake its territory and regain its liberty. He led a heroic but futile uprising against Russia and Prussia and was beaten. In this war, by the time it's over, they took over the rest. You understand? Do you have the next thing, the last thing I sent you? What's the name? No, that, that. Yeah. He had, look at this. A Jewish cavalry brigade fought in his war. This is famous of yesterday, Barak Yoselovich. This guy... <laughs> Is a Jew. That's Kosciuszko, and that's him taking the oath when he begins the rebellion, in which he says, "All Poles, it could be a Protestant, even a Jew, can join the army and get the equal rights." And a lot of the Poles say, "Like this, if Poland can only regain its liberty by help for the Jews, then the heck with it." You know, look, look how stupid they were. You understand? Know but it didn't matter because they got overwhelmed by the Russian army and the Prussian army. Uh, this guy was a Polish national hero. So he wasn't a from Jew, but he. Uh, formed, a ca I mean, this got to be a movie. Who here is in the Hollywood business? Yeah. He formed a cavalry brigade, Polish cavalry brigade of Jews with beards, and they didn't fight on, they didn't fight on Shabbos, and they kept kosher, at least that's what they say. I don't know how they worked that out, but uh, there was no star K at the time, you know. So, but nevertheless, uh, it said they were wiped out by the Russians in a, in a certain battle. Anyhow, um, this, this means that Poland was raped the third time, final time. And yeah, that's it. Let's get it right there. What does this mean? Russia took the, this is Prussia took the rest, and Austria took the rest, and Russia took the biggest chalik. So if you're to Vilna Gon, a year or two before you die, a year and a half before you die, the Russians come in and take over Vilna. Okay? I said, that's interesting. And all of a sudden, it's a new reality. You're not living in the old, the old Poland doesn't exist anymore. Poland did not become a country for another 120 years. 
From then on until the end of the First World War, there was no Poland. There was, uh, not really, there was a phony Poland, as we'll see. But uh, it was split between the three neighbors. What was their basis for doing it? Mike, Nate's right. We, we can do it. Who's going to stop us? And I'll tell you something. These three uh, criminals, because here's Catherine the Great in her old days, you know, saying, I won, which she did. They were smart for 100 years, a little more than 100 years. For 100 years, they didn't go to war against each other. And so uh, three thieves, you know, uh, all agreed, you keep your part, I keep my part, we'll all be happy. And then they made the mistake called World War I, and then the whole thing fell apart. And Poland got his freedom back. But as long as the thieves were wise enough to agree to share the spoils, Eastern Europe was a, was a, a war-free zone other than the Napoleon era. So, as I said before, there's no Poland left over. Where's Poland? There's uh, Prussia. There's Austria. There's uh, Russia. Where, what happened to Poland? It's gone. And the Polish government is no longer in charge of the Jews. All the things I was talking about don't matter anymore. What the same says, there is none. The parliament says, what the nobles say, all the rest say. Uh, so who's in charge of the largest Jewish community by far in the world after the three partitions of Poland? That, my friends, is something we'll do next time. Stay tuned.